So I have a quick question for you. What's the difference between a fanfic writer and a novelist working with a licensed set of characters? My personal answer? The paycheck. So, as we walk through the heart of the stories we tell, I want to every once in a while take a moment to craft my own ideas and throw them out there. Now, I'm trying to sell my own novels, so I'm not going to do too much with original. But since I can't write up using other people's IP, well, not legally anyway, I instead figure it would be a great way to explore those stories in ways that haven't been told, or in some that have, by trying to figure out new ways to fit the theme and setting. If you happen to be a big-time producer of these IPs, feel free to contact me for more work. But if not, sit back and enjoy some basic fan work. Then go down to the comment section and tell me everything I got wrong and why my pitch sucks. Then maybe we'll talk about it in a future video. Today, I want to start off in the most dangerous of places. I want to rip off the mouse. So Star Wars Under the Disney banner is looking to put out a movie every year. Right now, we're about to see if the anthology idea will work with Rogue One. If you've been paying attention at all, there's some rumors that they had to do some reshoots. However, I think I want to pitch a completely different idea, based on what we know about what works in stories in general, and very specifically what works in Star Wars. I'm even going to tie it into some other Disney franchises with how they know things work. So why don't you join me here, and we'll see what you think of my pitch. You know what the first thing that strikes me about Star Wars is? And it seems simple on the surface. Everyone loves lightsaber battles. I mean, seriously, it was probably one of the most anticipated things about the prequels and one of the things that people talked about the most about the new sequels. So, first, I think we need a time period with both Jedi and Sith, where they can do battle. But we've already had Jedi and Sith doing battle, so we need something that's going to spark it, something that's going to be a little different. And we already know that when the Phantom Menace starts, the Jedi think the Sith are dead, so we need to go back further. So this anthology I'm pitching has to be pre the first prequel. You know what's something that everyone loves to? but hasn't really been done well in Star Wars? A love story. No, no, hold on, I said a good love story. Not pre-teen calling a queen an angel, or whatever they called that. We know that Jedi try to teach love out of their students, that they want almost emotionless robot monks. So, this has tragedy written all over it. And then there's the fact that Star Wars and Disney in general has been going on kind of a feminist kick for strong female characters. And my first thought is to go with the greatest inspiring love story of all. The story with unparalleled woe, that of Juliet, and her Romeo. So to do this right, we need two sides of, of war. We need Romeo's side and Juliet's side. And we have this. We have the Sith and we have the Jedi. And you know what? Both of them are bad guys for this. You know why? because I like the idea of a protagonist being a Sith. And the real story takes place with both of them being kick-ass combatants and both of them being pretty cool characters. So let's get started and delve into what we can do with this. So our story opens, well, you know, after the crawl, with an alien-looking Jedi and his human teenage apprentice. They're fighting some bounty hunters and trying to free a station that some hut has taken control of. It's like a James Bond opening on the last mission. It's three to five minutes of action setting up that there's a young Padawan apprentice, our Juliet, and that she's already a badass in complete control. The sequence will be intercut with an after-action report to the Jedi Council, where the Master will say his apprentice is ready for the trials and to become a knight. The Council will say they will think about that, but before they do, they have a solo mission, specifically for her. The next scene opens, and we're introduced to a young boy, about the same age as The Apprentice, so both probably about 17 years old. He's pacing and getting upset with an older-looking alien dude. These are our Sith. See, the Master is planning an intrigue plot to get into the corporate sector, to move large amounts of money and lay the seeds for his own plan against the Jedi. His apprentice, though, is sick of money and numbers and backwater deals. He wants to hit something. 
The lesson he needs is patience. But his master decides he likes angry and ready for a fight. So instead, he tells him to make something useful. He sends him to a planet that is known for its nightlife. He tells him to find a crime lord by the name of such and such and work with him. It will give him an outlet he needs and at the same time build him in combat. Then we go to this slightly older but still young woman on the Senate floor. Well, the hover pod thingies are moving around. She has been arguing about inroads both the Huts and Corsac have made into the system owned by the Republic. As she finishes her argument, the Senate is going into recess. Insert joke about Congress not getting anything done. And she is called to the Chancellor's office. And in here, we have her and the Chancellor having a conversation. And the Chancellor informs her that, point blank, she has enemies. And she mouths off that she always has. The Chancellor wants to assign her protection, and she laughs it off. She doesn't want some armed group around her. She's a senator for the people, by the people. And she would lose that position in a moment if she had to have soldiers around her at all times. But the Chancellor has a compromise, a way to have her protected without a large military group around her. And that is a Jedi. Not just any Jedi, but one that can look like just a friend or aide. In walks the apprentice from the beginning, but not in Jedi robes, in civilian garb. Her assignment is to protect the senator. Sound familiar? Now we have a beat-for-beat -beat comparison right into the prequel trilogy. But you know, not cute opposite-sex senator who they have a history with, because these Jedi have a clue on what hormones are. So instead, what we have are two women who are relatively close in age, within 10 years, who can pose and work together to defend the senator. Now we have the senator heading home, and guess what planet she's from? Yup, the same one where Tall, Dark, and Sith is heading. And now, we start building towards our conflict. So now we have the rest of Act 1 with both of our protagonists on the same planet but at different places. Our Sith guy, our Romeo, we find was basically a street urchin with force talent. And then at a certain age, the current member of the Sith found him and started his training. He is the best muscle this crime lord could hope for. And he has some soft spots that the crime lord plays up here and there. On the other side of the story is the Senator and the Jedi becoming friends, and the Senator feeling sorry for the Jedi, who she quickly learns never really had a childhood. Remember, younglings are trained right from early age. So this Jedi, our Juliet, remembers her parents are home, but only very slightly. She's been a ward of the Jedi Temple since she was four. Now I know I said people like lightsaber fights, but neither Jedi nor Sith have pulled any for quite some time. The end of Act 1, beginning of Act 2, comes with the costume ball. Oops, I mean fundraising party. Huh, <laughs> silly me. See, the Senator has this party every year for her allies on the planet, and it's a bit open, so the Jedi is having a hard time trying to protect her. And one of those allies that she has invited is the crime boss, who's bringing his new low-level thug to enjoy the wine and women. And this is where the Romeo and Juliet part really kicks off. So preparing for this, the Senator tries to get the Jedi to lighten up, including buying her a dress for the occasion. So at the party, guess who, by providence, or maybe by will of the Force, end up dancing together? You guessed it. But the two don't have long to enjoy each other's company, because in unison, they get a bad feeling. Now I'm going to pause the story for a second here and talk about symbolism. Specifically, the most famous symbol of Romeo and Juliet is the rose that would not smell any sweeter if it had a different name. What I want to do is I want to pepper different scenes with green roses when our favorite female Jedi is around and red roses when our villain is, well, our Sith is around. Both are really protagonists, neither is a villain. And why? Because those match the colors of their lightsabers, green and red. 
and then at the end of the movie, we'll show a black one to show the tragedy of all this. But it's just lightly in the background of a few scenes. Boom! Act 2 starts with a bomb meant to kill the senator, but the Jedi saves her, and her new dance partner, a man of great passion, takes off after one of the caterers who is obviously the bomber. She pursues, and a three-way qu chase quickly ends. After all, Sith and Jedi are totally overmatched for this bomber. They find the bomber, and they interrogate him with a quick mesh-up of good cop, bad cop, well, good Jedi, bad Sith, and find that he works for a hut and his contract is a rival crime boss that wanted to kill both the senator and the crime boss that Sith Boy is working for. So now the two are staring at each other. They can feel they're both Force-sensitive, but neither can say who they work for. They both are pretty much undercover. Now remember, too old to begin the training means that Force users slip through the cracks all the time, so they don't realize the other is really trained. Now here is where actor and actress are important. We need a good and in-control girl out of her element for the first time, and a bad boy with the heart of gold, and we need chemistry. Chemistry up the wazoo between the two of them. He wants to hunt down the crime lord. She wants to play defensively, but he convinces her that the best defense is a good offense. As the story ramps up, we now have the fact that the senator and the crime boss both know who one of the two are but not the other. And they're more than happy to play matchmaker here, the crime boss thinking the relationship would move him closer to his political connection, the senator seeing this as a way to help the Jedi learn to let her hair down. Both of them push just a little. The end of Act 2 will be the finding of the rival crime lord who is working with the hut who wants the senator dead, and fight that will require quite a reveal, one with a red lightsaber and one with a green one. Picture the two pro young protagonists fighting back-to-back, -back, Sith and Jedi, against some bounty hunters and droids and who knows what else. Then question of, where did you get that after the fight? Which leads to our version of the balcony scene. We follow our Juliet back to the Senator's home. For all intents and purpose, she knows what she has to do. She calls her contact to report into the Council, and only tells them the fight leaving out the Sith entirely. She walks through a room and finds him there. She pulls her saber, and he just holds his out. He doesn't want to fight. He always wants to fight, but not now. She deactivates her lightsaber and asks why he had to be one of them. But we don't get an answer. We fade to the Jedi Council and her old master. They know something is wrong. Her report sounded off, and they could feel it in the Force. So now we ramp up to the conclusion and the real twist on who the villain is here. Both the Sith and the Jedi, or, well, at least they're the antagonists. Our star-crossed lovers can't go to the Jedi for help. Even her old master is pretty much ready to kill her lover. They can't go to his Sith master because he can't reveal himself yet, and he doesn't trust this new Jedi wench that his apprentice has. So remember those lightsaber fights I promised? Well, here we go. Act 3. Old master, and she has to strike him down to defend her dark Sith lover. Then that turns the heat up to 11. The final is the two of them, surrounded by Jedi, fighting to the death to try to get out. It isn't a poison and a dagger for their suicide. No, they go down fighting, a fight they know they can't win. The true tragedy is summed up by our senator as she reflects on the fact he could have been redeemed. Anything that doesn't bend eventually breaks. Alternatively, you could make it a duology, make a two-part anthology that has them running to hut space and trying to survive, but there's part of me that really likes the idea of the final scene being the senator staring at a black rose, thinking about the fact that both died because the Jedi didn't trust love. Now, this isn't a fully fleshed out outline by a long shot. This could use some polish before it's even an elevator pitch. But remember at the beginning when I said that I wanted to use information that I know Marvel, or that I know Disney has? I want to take stuff from Marvel. Marvel has done studies that show that superhero movies do better when you add a subgenre. It's why Winter Soldier was a spy movie. It's why Guardians of the Galaxy was a space opera. Because when you mesh things together, and I think it's going to be true for Star Wars too, 
I think that Star Wars anthologies are going to do better when you mix and match. Now, maybe the story of Romeo and Juliet isn't quite the right one. Again, I'm just spitballing here. It was just an off-the-cuff idea. But taking one of the great stories and refunctioning it into the Star Wars universe, repurposing it entirely, I think is the way that they're going to do best. I don't know about you, but I don't need to see young Obi-Wan and young Yoda and young Han. And there's going to be a point when they're just going to run out with diminishing returns. What we need is a subgenre. We need an awesomely written movie that takes place in Star Wars and uses the best parts of Star Wars. And in my opinion, this could be worked into it. But hey, who knows? I'm just a nobody spitballing ideas here. Maybe you have a better one. If so, put it down in the comment section. Or maybe you think I missed a golden opportunity. Or maybe you think that I rambled on too long. Either way, let me know in the comments. I have lots of ideas for videos like this. Maybe I could pitch a new Star Trek or Mask movie. There's lots of things I think could be tweaked here and there. It actually all goes back to something that I had forgotten about until I started making this video. If you'd ever read the book Killing Mr. Griffin, my high school English teacher made me read it. One of the first things he does that makes everyone hate him is tell them they need to write an additional bit for a Shakespearean play. And the joke is, yeah, all I have to do is improve on Shakespeare, right? But then, over the years, I've realized it's relatively easy to improve on something, even something a great master wrote, because you have the benefit of hindsight. You have the ability to look from outside. And partially that's what this is too, an outside view on these projects. So, join me back here next time when we'll go into more bits of stories and comparisons. And in the meantime, if you're interested in hearing my pitch on other ideas, let me know in the comment section as well. For now, I'd like to thank you for taking this walk with me through the heart of the stories we tell.